worship. Um, Moses had a brother, Aaron, and he had a sister, Miriam, too, and she's the one rescued, that, that took him down to the river in the basket. And, um, well, I don't know who took him down there, but she was there when the Pharaoh's daughter found him, and she said, she said do you want somebody to nurse him? And she said, my mother would do that. So his own mother got to do that. That was Miriam. And Aaron, I don't know if Aaron was born before Moses or not. I don't know. But they were to be, Aaron and his sons were to be commissioned as the priests in the service of God, starting from the Exodus. And the Levites were to be helpers in all that. They were to, the ones who were qualified to carry things, to set up the tent and do all these particular things. And in Leviticus chapter 10, we see uh, something went wrong here in the heart of they were, they were, Aaron had four sons and they were the ones to, to, to do um, certain things but in, in, in Leviticus 10 uh, verse number 1 Aaron's sons Nadab and Abihu took their censers and put fire in them and added incense and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord contrary to his command. I think the King James calls it profane fire, but it was contrary to the instructions. It wasn't how they were supposed to do that. Verse two, so fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them and they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will be proved holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. And Aaron remained silent. Of course, half of his sons now were dead. The two remaining sons were Eleazar and Ithamar. Nadab and Abihu were the two oldest sons of Aaron. Their uncle then was Moses. And God established Aaron and his four sons and their descendants as the priesthood that was to lead the people in worship. Numbers chapter 3, 2 to 3. The names of the sons of Aaron were Nadab, the firstborn, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. And those were the names of Aaron's sons, the anointed priests who were ordained to serve as priests. In those days, people didn't approach God directly, but they had to approach God through the priest. That was the way it was ordained until Jesus came. In Exodus chapter 24, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. You are to worship at a distance, but Moses alone is to approach the Lord. The others must not come near, and the people may not come up with him. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said, we will do. In Exodus chapter 30, first 10 verses, these were the instructions. Make an altar of acacia wood for burning incense. It is to be square, a cubit long and a cubit wide. A cubit is, is this right here. That's a cubit. It's approximately 18 inches. Interestingly, then, in, uh, interestingly enough, the standard height of a chair is 18 inches or a cubit. Of course, it depends on who, whose arm you're measuring, whether the what. So it must have been, maybe it was Moses' forearm. I don't know, but that's, but that's what a cubit is. It's to be square, verse number two. A cubit long and a cubit wide and two cubits high. So it's three feet high. It's horns of one piece with it. Overlay the top and all the sides and horns with pure gold. 
and make a gold molding around it. Make two gold rings for the altar below the molding, two on each of the opposite sides to hold the poles used to carry it. Make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Put the altar in front of the curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant Law before the atonement cover that is over the tablets of the Covenant Law where I will meet with you. This was the altar, not the, not the bronze altar that they sacrificed animals on. This was the golden altar of incense. If you went behind the curtain, uh, you would see in front of you the Ark and the cherubim over the ark and the covering of the ark which was called the mercy seat you would see that and on the one side would be this golden altar of incense verse 7 Aaron must burn fragrant incense on the altar every morning when he tends the lamps he must burn incense, incense again when he lights the lamps at twilight so incense will burn regularly before the Lord for generations to come notice it says as Aaron must burn the incense. Verse 9, do not offer on this altar any other incense or any burnt offering or grain offering and do not pour a drink offering on it. It was a special altar for the burning of incense. They weren't to do anything else with it. Once a year, verse 10, Aaron shall make atonement on its horns. This annual atonement must be done with the blood of the atoning sin offering for the generations to come. It is most holy to the Lord. So this was a sacred altar, a sacred object. And as the priest of the Lord, Aaron, his sons, Nadab and Abihu, along with the other sons, were leaders of the worship. Uh, in Ex Exodus chapter 20, you have the Ten Commandments, and then you have in verse 26, And do not go up to my altar on steps, or your private parts may be exposed. This was a very sacred and separated thing from common life at that time. Everything in worship was to be kept holy. Everything. God was very specific as to what and where and who was to do what. At the ordination of Aaron and his sons in chapter 28, we see the specific directions for the ordination of Aaron and his sons. And so Aaron had certain gear, sacred garments, breastpiece, ephod, robe, the woven tunic, the turban, and the sash. Very detailed, highly ornamented, very specific. Aaron's sons had sacred garments, but not the f not all the stuff that Aaron had. In, uh, in chapter 29 of Exodus, starting with verse number 4, Then bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance to the tent of meeting, and wash them with water. Take the garments and dress Aaron with the tunic, the robe of the ephod, the ephod itself, and the breastpiece. Fasten the ephod on him by its skillfully woven waistband. Put the turban on his head and attach the sacred emblem to the turban. Take the anointing oil and anoint him by pouring it on his head. Verse 8, bring his sons and dress them in tunics and fasten caps on them. Then tie sashes on Aaron and his sons. The priesthood is theirs by a lasting ordinance. Then you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. Observe that Aaron was to be the high priest. He was to wear the official ephod, turban, etc. The sons got a tunic, a cap, and a sash. They were not equal to Aaron, and either in garments or in duties. Aaron was to burn the incense. The altar of incense was behind the veil in front of the atonement cover or the mercy seat. And this was the altar on which the annual atonement was offered. 
So Aaron was the one to offer the atonement at this point and the one who was to burn incense on the golden altar. In uh, chapter 37 to 10, Aaron must burn fragrant incense on the altar every morning when he tends the lamps. He must burn incense again when he lights the lamps at twilight. So incense will burn regularly before the Lord for generations to come. Do not offer on this altar any other incense or any burnt offering or grain offering. And do not pour a drink offering on it once a year. Aaron shall make atonement on his horns. This annual atonement must be made with the blood of the atoning sin offering for the generations to come. It is most holy to the Lord. Now you might think in your mind, how, why is all this? It doesn't matter why it is. What matters is God said to do it, and at least to start out with, they did it. But Nadab and Abihu had a flippant attitude. They showed an arrogance, a lack of respect, a lack of faith. They thought they could step into their father's place, contrary to the specific instructions that God gave them. First of all, they weren't the ones to offer the incense. They weren't, that wasn't their duty. It was Aaron's. Secondly, they used fire from an unauthorized source. We don't know if that was fire from the bronze altar. We don't know where that fire came from, but it wasn't. It said in the King James, a profane fire. It was an unauthorized fire. And number three, some scholars think that they could have been actually drunk at this point. But what they were doing dishonored God. It displeased God. The altar of incense was behind the curtain or veil. It was between the curtain and the Ark of the Covenant with its atonement cover, the mercy seat, the very place uh, that God said he would meet um, with Moses. So there above the cover, this is in Exodus 25, 22, between the two cherubim that are over the Ark of the Covenant, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. Notice he doesn't say I will meet you with you there so you can complain to me about this or that. <laughs> I will meet with you there and I will give you instructions there. Even the incense was specific to worship. There's, a, there's a, a recipe in Exodus chapter 30, verse 34 to 38, a recipe, I'm not going to read the whole thing in the interest of time, but a recipe how, the, how this was to be made. And, and then it says, do not make any incense with this formula for yourselves. Consider it holy to the Lord. Whoever makes incense like it to enjoy its fragrance must be cut off from their people. Everything was very specific in God's instructions. When God tells us to do something, we really better do it. And in those days, there was a quick response. Their attitude was unholy, Nadab and Abihu. They approached worship in a way that would bring attention to themselves. Worship has to be about God. <laughs> about God only. If worship is about the worshiper, it is profane. That kind of worship displeases God. It has to be about God only. People have different ideas about worship, what worship should be, what it should look like, what it should not look like. I remember I was on a telephone counseling bank one time and I was talking to this one lady that called in there. And I suggest, I led her to the Lord and I suggested to her a particular church and she said oh that's holy rollers <laughs> she said I'd like a little dignity in my religion you don't have any dignity before God oh I can't be worshiping like that her worship was probably just sitting and listening and observing 
It has to be about God. It's not defined by whether the music is fast or slow. It's not defined by whether we sing from a book or from a screen. We preached in a church. I preached in that church twice. They were looking for a pastor and it was too far away. So I, I said, I'll preach twice there for you, but I'm not going to be the pastor there. And uh, they had a very small congregation. They had a screen, but nobody knew how to use it. They had a sound system, and they knew how to turn it on. That's all they knew. It was, it was just for the microphone. And one of the, one of the guys told me, she said, he says, we, we want to sing those old hymnals, and we want to sing them from the book, period. Any other way to him wasn't worship. We don't get to decide all this stuff. God does, amen? Yeah. So I like blues. I like country gospel, blues gospel. Uh, I like bluegrass gospel. That kind of music is a turn off to some. But sometimes it makes me cry. We don't have our preferences. God's preference needs to be honored. And I don't see any place where he dictates the tempo of the worship music. They worshiped, they had music, they had horns and, and um, psalteries and um, harps and things like that. But I don't see any place where God indicates that he prefers fast music or slow music or drums or no drums. I don't see in the Bible where God has a preference about all that. I don't see that. I can remember years ago, we were in Illinois, I was driving along. I had to drive a lot for my work, and I was tuned in at a Christian station. There was a pastor on there that said, we will not ever have any upbeat or up-tempo or fast-paced music. That's not going to happen in our church. To him, there was something profane about that. But God doesn't say that. After the cross, after the resurrection, everything changed. Jesus fulfilled that Levitical law. Believers no longer have to go through the priest to worship God. From then on, we're able to approach God and worship Him directly. We don't have to go through a priest. We don't have to go through a pastor. We don't have to be in a certain place. We don't have to be in Jerusalem. We don't have to be in a certain temple. Jesus fulfilled all that and it's not necessary anymore. We don't have to have a priest go into the Holy of Holies and pour blood on the golden altar because Jesus already did that with his own blood. Those sacrifices were only a temporary substitute pointing to a time and a day when Jesus would allow his own blood to be sacrificed, paying the, penal paying the penalty for all mankind. Now that is why we worship, because we've been set free from the law of sin and death. We've been set free. We've been redeemed, saved by the blood of the Lamb. That's why we worship. Matthew 28, uh, verse 8. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And verse 17, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So what did that worship look like? Were they singing? They weren't a choir. <laughs> Did they have all instruments? Did they have a guitar and a drum with them? They worshiped him, poured their hearts out in gratitude to him. That was the worship. We don't, you can't picture those handful of disciples getting, in, getting songs organized, <laughs> getting instruments organized. So it's, that's one way to worship, but it's not the only way. Amen? 
Luke chapter 24, 50 to 53, when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. So what did that worship look like? I don't know. <laughs> they didn't have recording devices back then. But they were looking up because there he went. And they probably had their hands up because it was a Jewish way, lifting holy hands before the Lord. That was one of the ways they did worship. So they were worshiping and praising God. Then they worshiped him. We don't know what it looked like. We don't know what it sounded like. There was no worship leader, no music director, and no words to follow. It was all about him. All about him. It wasn't about the music. It wasn't about the instruments. They had been with him. They had seen him crucified. They had seen him die. Now they see him resurrected and lifting up into the clouds. The hearts are so stirred that they spontaneously pour out their hearts to him, honoring him for who he is, their precious Lord and Savior. We cry out to him in humility. We cry out to him in gratitude. We cry out to him in love. None of this is about the worshiper. Nadab and Abihu were bringing attention to themselves with a flippant attitude, and God destroyed them. All of our focus and all of our attention in worship has to be on God. Amen. Genesis 22, 5, he said to his servants, this is, Mo, this is Aaron, um, Abraham, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boys go over there. That was at Mount Moriah. We will worship and then we will come back to you. This is the first mention of the word worship in the Bible. And what was going on there was God called Abraham to sacrifice his only son. It was a test of Abraham's faith. But... Abraham carried the fire, and Abraham carried the knife, and his son Isaac carried the wood for the sacrifice. But here's what's interesting. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey. We're going over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. He was going to go as far as God, but he, but God had promised that through, through Isaac, a great nation would be. And it was. And he had that promise, and he believed God. And the New Testament says it was credited to him as righteousness. And he told, the, told those servants, we're going to go over there and worship, and we will come back to you. Isn't that an awesome statement of faith? God called him to do it. He was going to do it. Had the knife. Had the fire. But he says, we're going to come back. We are. He believed God. Awesome. But that was the first mention of worship. We're going to go over there and worship. Deuteronomy 12, 31. You must not worship the Lord your God in their way the nations around them because in worshiping their gods they do all kinds of detestable things the Lord hates they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifices to their gods we live in a, in a time when there are gods of atheism gods who encourage abortion, any abortion, any time, doesn't matter how long it is. Abortion right before birth. 
in this gender business is an affront to God. It really is. It's an affront to God. Isaiah 29, 13 says, The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. Well, that's in churches today. It's called liturgy. It's called, we grew up in a church like that. There was a rigmarole you go through and then you leave and you go home and you're convinced that God is real pleased with you because you did all that. <laughs> I just call it rigmarole. But it was just a planned, the, the statements, the everything was planned. The prayers are even pre-written. Does that please God? They think it does. I know there's believers in those churches. I know there are. In spite of the church, not because of the church. But they, their teaching is that they're saved by the church and the ordinances of the church. And you don't dare part from that. We, when we went to Catholic school when we were kids, and each one of us, my brother and sister and I, each one of us, the first day of school, we would come home and tell my mother, because she was Lutheran, she was going to hell. Because the nuns taught us that if you're not Catholic, you can't go to heaven. And we believed them because they were our teachers. So my dad had to straighten that out. My dad was Catholic. My mom's loser. So he had to straighten us out. But, but then the next year, my sister went. She came home saying the same thing. Two years later, my brother came home saying the same thing. Mom, you're not going to go to heaven because you're not Catholic. It has nothing to do with all that stuff. It's not about all the stuff. It's not about all the vestiture and all the golden stuff that's on the altars. That's why, that's why the Wesleys broke away from all that stuff in England and got back to the Bible and started having Brush Arbor meetings in the countryside in, in, in this country because it was just common folks getting together and worshiping God. It wasn't about all the vestitures and all the rest of that stuff. And Jesus speaking to the woman at the well said, Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of, they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus spoke those words to the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. Worship in spirit and in truth. Some think that means that we should worship in tongues. Well, we can do that, and it's great when we do. But before Jesus, the Son of God, came to be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins, they worshipped in flesh. They worshipped with objects and items, meaning the offerings of physical sacrifices, not spirit. They worship with the blood of goats and rams, lambs, doves, grain offerings, drink offerings, and those were physical things, not spirit things. The worship was physical. Bring your lamb, etc., and God will be pleased. And they, all they had to do is go through the motions. It was all about the flesh. And for many, it still is. That's why people leave churches, because the church is going through the motions and they don't see how that benefits them. Mainline churches are still going through the motions. That's what liturgy is. It's going through certain motions. And if you do all that, then God's pleased. Jump up and down three times and holler whoopee and sit down. It was a flesh thing. 
show up, read something, give something, and then go back to the sin life. <laughs> we've, we've seen that. But to worship in the Spirit, we must, that was Jesus' word, must, be tuned in to God. Not just going through the motions or saying some pre-written words. We must, Jesus said, must focus on the truth that God is real. That Jesus is God's son. And that he is God. We must focus on the fact that Jesus died for us. We have to make that personal. If no one else would ever have accepted his sacrifice, he still would have done it for one. He still would have done it for you. If no one else had accepted his blood-bought salvation, he still would have done that just for you. Amen. Focusing on the goodness of God, Worshiping your spirit, not with stuff, not with procedures, not just with observation, but in the spirit. Live a worshipful life, not just on Sunday. Then we come to worship together in corporate worship, which is different. But if you live a worshipful life, I mean, I can worship God with a fly rod in my hand, and I do that. Because I'm out in the middle of nowhere. And I can sense the presence of God there. You can probably worship God on a tractor. You can worship God while you're driving. You can worship God while you're walking around. You can worship Him when you put your head on the pillow. And you can worship Him when you wake up. And you don't have to make a sound. Or you can make a joyful noise. You can jump up and down and carry on. Well, I, I don't think I would do that. I, I, had, I had the hardest time getting up off the floor when that little boy prayed for me. <laughs> they got a hold of my arms and helped me get back up again. And the Bible talks about in heaven, they, they're throwing themselves down before him in worship. I don't think I'd want anybody to throw themselves down in here. <laughs> I mean, you can do that if you want to. We might have to get call an ambulance. <laughs> At least help you get back up. So I'm not talking about throwing themselves down. But that was one way. That, that, that's in heaven what the angels do. They throw themselves down. And the elders. But we come together to worship corporately. To worship together. And that's a wonderful thing. But we need to have a worshipful life. We need to have a worshipful life. That our life needs to be a worship. That's why when you see somebody that needs God, and you can tell because God speaks to your spirit about, and you go say something. Sometimes they'll say, "Get away from me," and sometimes you get to lead them to the Lord. That's a worshipful thing that we do when we give our tithes and offerings, so we can keep the lights on. That's a worshipful thing that we do. Sometimes we do it sacrificially. There's a lot of ways to, to, to worship. Let's, let's do this. Let's play that last song again, that, that last song again. And uh, come on down here and gather around and we'll just worship.